This episode of the Capsule in Conversation is brought to you by Harrogate Spring Water. Harrogate is the home of the British Spa and Britain's premium natural source water. Hello everyone, welcome back to the Capsule in Conversation. I'm Natalie Anderson and today I'm joined by one of Yorkshire's finest, actress and writer Gaina Fay to talk switching things up, soothing the soul and settling into the syndicate. So sit back, relax and get ready to join in with our conversation. had a gorgeous week. It's been a time of finding freedom as the lockdown restrictions eased on Monday with hairdressers shops and pub gardens reopening. Although I have to say I think the most free thing I've done is walked into McDonald's to order a McFlurry for my son. Hardly rock and roll. Still I hope you've all had a fabulous time however you've chosen to take advantage of life less locked down. I most certainly cannot wait to have a glass of Prosecco on a restaurant terrace with my lovely guest today. Not only is she a wonderful friend of mine, she's also an acclaimed actress of stage and screen. Most recognisable for starring in notable dramas, playing the field, Fat Friends and The Chase, alongside portraying the iconic roles of Judy Mallet and Megan Macy in Coronation Street and Demmerdale. She's also appeared on stage in the West End production of Calendar Girls and as part of the original cast of the stage version of Band of Gold. She's a former Dancing on Ice champion who is full of Yorkshire grit. It is the wonderful Gaynor Faye. Hi, Gaynor. <laughs> Hello, darling. It's so lovely to see you. It feels and like you, forever. I know. It's been like we've been in this madness, this just darkness for so oh, long. <laughs> I know. Doesn't it feel good to be just finally be able to be go out and go out and the thought of having a cocktail me and you sat on a terrace somewhere <laughs> it's just like right when let's go when, let's go, let's go. And, it, oh, and it'll be so nice and it'll be fizz and everything oh my god I mean obviously you know lockdown kind of has eased a bit over the last week have you taken advantage of any new freedoms um well you know what I I wasn't going to but then my daughter Lily was like mom can we go to town <laughs> I was like really you want to go in on the first day she said I just want to go and See, and then I thought, do you know what? These kids have been locked down for so long and teenagers, you know, and all children, everyone has, but teenagers, it's... So I was like, yeah, they will go around. And I was like mooching around, but on, you know. <laughs> it, it, and to be honest with you, the last time we were all released, it went crazy. So I was very, you know, it, it, I was worried that that would be the case too. But people seem to be wearing the masks and people seem to be social distancing. And it was lovely to see smiles. People were all smiling and happy and jubilant that the shops were open and that they could see each other, you know, and I think that's what it is, isn't it? It's just that personal touch. Yeah, and I think you're right, you know, in in that sense that I think this last lockdown has been a huge shock for everybody. I think the first one was a bit like, wow, the weather's lovely and it's a holiday, you know what I mean? (laughs) And lots of people kind of enjoyed it, but this one was really quite hellish you know I've said very openly on this podcast how how hard I found it with homeschooling and running a business and everything else and then I think people are more cautious because they genuinely don't ever want to go back there again definitely definitely with this last lockdown I think the weather the fact that it was we were all so uncertain as to when it was going to lift um and actually like the first lockdown nobody really a lot of people didn't know of somebody who'd had it whereas now people know of people who've had covid who passed away sadly of it who've been really ill with it who've got long covid you know it's it's so near to us and it's you know we know everybody knows someone who's had it so it makes it very uh, real uh, as opposed to the first time when it was kind of oh we're all you know like you say we're locked down it's beautiful weather let's get the ice cream let's drink <laughs> loads of fizz and you know and, and it was all new but this felt like oh here we go again and, and you I know think so well. I think it struggled There's been this almost, I mean, they said it a lot in the first lockdown, this like wartime mentality almost. And I think, you know, in the first one, it was like everybody coming together and it was like, yes, we've got spirit. But for me, and I said this to my best friend, I said, 
I can't imagine actually living through this for five years. If you think that we, we've done like nearly like, you know, over a year now and it's yeah. dragged and it's it's getting harder. And well, the last 12 months definitely got harder towards the back end. And I'm so grateful that we do have these, you know, stri- slight kind of easing of restrictions because I couldn't imagine it going on any longer because I just don't know what it would have done to people's mental health and just their well-being. Exactly. And, you know, and obviously now as well, we have the means to be able to sort our mental health or at least reach out to people. Then, you know, people didn't. They just had to go through this horrific lockdown situation with no food. And I mean, at least we've been, you know, once once all that crazy flour and toilet paper and all those crazy <laughs> do you things that? happening. <laughs> oh, I couldn't believe it. I was like, why do they, why do they need toilet paper? <laughs> I couldn't I could get, I got the flour and I got all that, but I didn't get the toilet, I never got the toilet paper thing, but hey, you know, sometimes we don't understand things, we just have to let them go. We've got to um, let it go, haven't we? We've got to let them go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or it go, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that no. was the toilet paper thing. <laughs> Now, I mean, you're currently starring in the, you know, in the syndicate on BBC One, which we will talk more about later yeah. on. But before we do, you know, you were actually one of the few productions that managed to get into production last year. I mean, what was that like? I mean, that must have been a whole different experience for you. Well, you know, first and foremost, we felt so lucky that we managed to be able to get the show up and running. Mm. You know, it was a, to a great cost in lots of ways. You know, financially, obviously, mm. we had to have COVID tests and for the for the company. Um, but as an actor, being able to work when everywhere else was just shut, you know, closing down, getting postponed, getting cancelled, jobs, the West End had gone dark, every theatre had gone dark, the broad, Broadway had gone dark. It was, we felt extremely fortunate, but it was really, really tough. You know, I mean, mm. we know what it's like. The, the social element of work is lovely, isn't it? That yeah. socialising afterwards and and um, being able to chat and, and pass, the, you know, at lunch times and things. They're kind of like the bonus bits yeah, of work. Yeah, that's where you bond as well. Yeah, it's definitely the bonding part. So all that goes. So we, we literally had a box that was provided, you know, that we'd have to do a little menu on a morning, like being in hospital. <laughs> <laughs> to, uh, uh, I'd like that for my breakfast and that for my lunch. And then and then you get it in the box. I mean, it, you know, and you weren't allowed to touch anything. Oh, so it was it was very strange. But, but predominantly everybody was in it. It was such a, a unique situation that we all wanted to make it work. We all wanted to uh, protect everybody. And we had this incredible um, medic, COVID medic on board, Phil, who was fantastic. Who all, you know, we had our temperature te- te- checked every day. We had the COVID test. We had we had to go in bubbles, and um, yeah, I think I think the overall sense was that we were very very fortunate to be in work, but it was but it was tough. And I mean, it, was it must anxiety. be so incredible now to actually see it being aired and to think wow we did it mm. and for us the viewer we would have no no clue I mean it's so brilliant it's so the production values are amazing I'm, what you've achieved as a team is just incredible so you almost feel brilliant together it's I think that's it it's like now watching it it's like the fruits of your labor isn't it it's always lovely to be able to reap the fruits of your labor and we don't do that enough in our business you know we're on to the next job and you know and I think that I remember somebody once saying that, really rejoice in what you've done because you're all so quick to move on to the next job or the next thing. And, and you, you know, and, and so much effort and time and energy goes into making these, these projects. And for people, you know, so it, it's really important that people, you know, um, kind of support, you know, support things because we made this in COVID, you know, mm. it's really tough. And and then you'll get like, I mean, we've had wonderful, wonderful feedback, but then you'll get like people, ugh, ugh, and you kind of go, you try making the show in COVID. You try keeping things light and, you know, avoiding anyone wearing a mask. And it's, it's, it was, you know, it's, it's a real sense of achievement. And, and I, I think, think as well for, for, you know, the television industry and the film industry, but more so the television industry, I think more people have seen, uh, there's been more respect actually because it's been television that have kept people going, you know, Netflix, all the huge dramas like Normal People that r- everybody was talking about right in the first lockdown. It has been these projects that have kept people's spirits up. So as you say, you know, to have somebody give a bit of negative criticism, it's really annoying, <laughs> like go away. It's, a, it's always annoying, but we don't listen to them anyway. But it, I mean, it's just, 
you know, sit there and you sit there in on your little keyboard going, oh, I don't like this. Well, great. <laughs> don't watch <Pop> it then. <laughs> <laughs> For all the other people who watch it, you know, don't worry about it. But um, yeah, all the like series, the box sets have just been yeah. a lifesaver, haven't they? Haven't, haven't they? And um, yeah, so I'm it, just it's, really... It has been amazing to see the amount of television. You know, as I, as I said kind of in the beginning, in this intro, you've played so many, so many amazing characters. But, you know, if we go right back to the beginning, what was it that actually made you want to be an actress? I mean, I think I just wanted to be somebody else. And I'm, I'm sure that a therapist would tell you something uh, <laughs> quite magical about that. But uh, yeah, that, that was just how I wanted to be. I always pretended I was somewhere else and made up these stories about, I think my poor mum and dad, they used to have to back up my stories just to uh, <laughs> support me when friends would say, oh, did you, do you live in a caravan? Oh, <laughs> or uh, are you from, are you from Israel? Are you, whereabouts in Israel did you live then? I'd be like, I've just made these <laughs> crazy stories about my life. Or that I had um, cats and uh, with, I had 10 kittens and if, and people wanted to come and see my kittens and stuff. I mean, it's crazy. But um, yeah, so I think that they wanted to be, you know, kind of always in like a little drama in my head. But I started out, I think, at school. So I played Dorothy um, um, at Lawnswood. Yeah. And um, and I used to do plays in the back garden because obviously my mum went back to college when I was quite young. And um, so she was writing things. And so she used to write us little things to do in the six-week holidays. And me and my friends at school uh, from the street and some school friends used to put a play together in the six-week holidays, put it on, get the get some money then we'd say bring a chair it's <laughs> bring a chair. <laughs> and then they used to bring the chair into the back garden we had this long back garden we had like a little patio area and we used to do the play on the patio you know, with some props that my mum had got from my theatre company and um yeah it was it was great it kept us entertained and it well, kept i love how well. enterprising <laughs> you were as well like yep you know this is it that's your seat but you'll have to bring a chair you know making it yeah. all together Oh yeah, and I drew the programs. I made the programs and everything, and like painted them because I used to love painting and drawing. And then we'd go to Alton Towers with if we got some money, and we'd, obviously, you know, we'd never got that much money, but we'd go and do like a day out for, the, for our treat at the end of it. So yeah, I think it came from that. And and then I played, as I said, I was doing, I played Dorothy, and I got a drum roll when I walked on. I was like, oh yeah. I like that. <laughs> This is what I need always in life. Uh, yeah. I know drum now. Wherever I go, <laughs> <laughs> a drum roll. I'll, I'll note to self. I remember that now in the future. <laughs> yeah, I need to a drum roll. But you know, if we obviously we fast forward and you have played so many incredible characters. I mean, one of my personal favourites is you know Judy Mallet in Coronation Street yeah. back in the nineties, back in the day. And I remember oh. your character arriving with this huge mane of beautiful hair and those incredible <laughs> outfits and I mean I think I fell in love with her wardrobe straight away I was like wow her wardrobe's amazing you know, <laughs> what was it like playing her you know at that time as well when soap in particular was just all over wasn't it oh it, it was the golden era of soap I mean mm. I, I'm so fortunate that I was involved in Corrie when there was Betty Turpin, Mavis um, Percy Sugden, Julie, Go you know, uh, Bet Lynch, Raquel. I mean, the soap gods, you know. Yeah. And I was, and I was there in amongst them all, which was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. I just, it was incredible to be able to be part of that at such a young age. I don't think you realise, you know, because I mean, I did. It was iconic, and obviously, always on in our house, and my nana and granddad. You know, it's it's an iconic show, still is. Um, I just, and I was so fortunate because I used to get storyline after storyline after storyline I was you know and that as we both know it's incredible to, get, to to be able to get that because they get shared out don't they but yeah. I just seem to be constantly you know and I had lots to do with Joanne Froggy who's gone on to do amazing things you know and it was her first ever job and in fact she kind of she said I don't even know whether she auditioned or whether she came with her friend for the audition um but yeah I mean she'd never done anything before and so many people come and go in that show that are just huge now. They've gone off to Hollywood and 
you know it's it was such an amazing i mean we like as you said we both know kind of soap is an amazing place to start out in your yeah. career because you have to learn very fast everything's thrown mm. at you but equally you're given storylines that you probably wouldn't necessarily get elsewhere because they might go oh well we wouldn't cast you as that but because you're in a, a show that's ever changing you, you, yeah. you're given stuff that you're kind of like oh wow i never would have thought i would have to be shot or this or that or do you know <laughs> ma the mad stuff or be the killer or whatever yeah. else and just that turnaround but for me what I loved about her character that you know Judy was she was very strong as well you know obviously Corrie women are known for being very strong yeah and I think that very much came across I mean also for you at that time you were in the soap during the 90s which was mm. a decade really quite for women I would say it was quite difficult actually to mm. because you know, there was lad mags and there was like the ladette culture. And even though the Spice Girls were going on about girl power, I don't mm. necessarily think that that was very true of that time, you know, and especially in soaps. I know that a lot of women at that time were encouraged to do certain photo shoots and all kinds of different yeah. stuff. But I know you actually was stand your ground and say, that's yeah. not really for me. Was that mm. difficult to have that attitude at that time? And, you know, I mean, fair enough for people who did go down that, that route. I, I chose not to. I didn't. I kind of wanted to not, you know, have my body on show in any way. And and, and also because my character was so, as Vera Duck was called, a dog rough. Um, I just kind of wanted to keep in the, I don't know, I just, it just wasn't for me. And I had never had any problem with anyone else doing it. It just wasn't my kind of thing. And, but yeah, you were encouraged to kind of do it, obviously, um, because it was, it was great. And, you know, and you could get put, I mean, some people did it and got an amazing amount of other stuff out of it. You know, you can get lots of different things out of it, but it just wasn't my. It's kind of hard, thing. though, I think, as well, you know, to, to have, to stay true to yourself. And, you know, for mm. me, like that that rings true of who you are. You are very true to yourself. And, you know, mm. like you say, standing your ground. I mean, did, did you ever, like, kind of waver or were you like, no, I'm steadfast and that's it? Yeah, no, I'm steadfast. I honestly, if there's one thing in my life that I do do is, I'm, I'm, I suppose in lots of ways, because I'm a bit stubborn, <laughs> I kind of have this uh, thing that, no, I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do, you know, and sometimes, you know, that you, you can miss out on things. But no, I just knew that that's, that was it. I think the most I ever probably did was um, when I was on holiday, and mm. I, I think I did a shoot. In, on holiday with my then partner and um, I think I was in like a, a bikini and a sarong on the beach and I think that was because because I was on a beach you know if I'd have been yeah. fully clothed on the beach it would have looked really quite strange and I was with my partner and it wasn't kind of I knew it wasn't kind of titillation it was more the fact that you this know this is you on we, holiday yeah, yeah this yeah, is us totally. together on holiday and that was that but um, I mean, other than that no the industry has changed dramatically, you know, even in the last 10 years. I mean, yeah. there's no longer like sexiest male and female, which I remember I was just leaving Emmerdale when they chose to scrap those awards. And I was oh, like, really? oh, thank God, because <laughs> for us, like it, it, that those kind of awards, you know, put pressure on actors and actresses when actually our job is often to be the most vulnerable on screen. And it's not about looking pretty. It's about portraying real life, isn't it? I mean, it's been such a huge change, I think, in the last 10 years, which I do you feel is it's 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 so much better now for people? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and and the I mean, there's still an enormous amount of pressure on us, you know, mm. I mean, plastic surgery and, and, you know, all these procedures are, are more popular than ever now. Yeah, yeah there is sorry. pressure. There is still pressure on us. And like you say, you know, it is, it is, things are changing. What I love particularly as well is that we're seeing more older women on screen. You know, like you've Fantastic. got Brenda Blethyn in Vera. I was seeing Emily Watson last night in Too Close. And I'm like, wow, these older women taking in these lead stories. That's yeah. a huge jump, isn't it? I mean, I remember like even, again, 10 years ago, you got to your mid thirties and it was like, oh, there's no roles for you now. But things are really changing, aren't they? Well, I hope so. I mean, to be honest with you, I think that's still there as well, um, Natalie. I think, sadly, you know, I think it's just gone from the 30s to the 40s now. So yeah. I think that there is people, you know, we, we do become a bit transparent and we do then become somebody's mum or somebody's, you know. But luckily, it's, it, you know, that there are the, the parts that are there. 
but then there's a lot of actors who are available for those parts and they're not they're still few and far between so if you think about the male leads in in stuff mm -hmm. compared to the female leads in in programs it needs there's still a long way to go to balance it up i mean but it is fantastic that it's happening and that's why Kay is great because she always writes for strong women she always writes great female characters you know whoop whoop and so so does what sally wayne right and you know there's lots of writers now who are writing for women which is which is great but it still needs to go a long way to address the balance yeah this is definitely still very much unbalanced but as you just mentioned there you know like kate is brilliant for that and you as a family have really pushed and pushed the boundaries of yeah. i remember actually when i spoke to your mum on the podcast right back in series one about band of gold and she was oh, yeah. saying it took eight years to get it mm -hmm. commissioned she said you know nobody wanted a female writer talking mm -hmm. about women in the sex trade <laughs> she said you know okay. and it was so hard to get that across the line but thank god that she did because that went on really to open up an avenue for so many different writers and for so many different actors like and as i was saying you know, even like your, your sister yvonne just mm. women being at those levels as an executive producer it's about that isn't it? it's about getting women into those senior levels and in commissioning as well so that we can make change yeah absolutely i think i think that there's always got to be somebody who opens opens it up and you know it's it's fantastic and i'm extremely proud of my mom for doing that you know she really created a space for women in all ways you know women leading women in in the acting writing directing producing her own company so you know just taking a control because it's not because she won't you know it's a, a controlling thing it's because he, the only way sometimes to get things done is to take control of them the situation and um yeah i think she yeah and, and i'm all for that so uh, yeah. i'm very encouraging of women as well and and obviously my sister is incredible so yeah and hopefully it will get passed down and keep keep going i definitely think it is i think like i said you know all of you together as a collective have definitely paved the way for many younger people coming through and you know kind of getting themselves seen and because without we, we, we the doors would still be very shut do you know what i mean the glass ceiling would still be there and we've still got a long way to go like you said but yeah fingers crossed you know with with us pushing forward we, we can actually make a difference i mean one of my most favorite characteristics about you gainer is that you are very fair and very balanced and i think you know all all the time i've ever known you it's like gainer sees things from both sides <laughs> now i know that buddhism is hugely important to you would you mm. say that it's those teachings that have helped you with that attitude absolutely 100 percent um it's all about the middle ways buddhism it's all about um seeing both sides and using your wisdom courage and compassion through chanting nam myoho and to to be able to take actions with those three you know components so very much so i i try to be um always fair to everything and to try and see both sides sometimes it's hard you know i mean there's situations <laughs> where it's very difficult to see both sides but there's always a reason for everything and so if you can just take yourself try and not think about how you would react mm. to it just try and evaluate it all but i mean i became a buddhist 26 years ago now i mean it's crazy but um it's just part of my life and it and on a morning you know when i chant it raises my life state and through this COVID, it's just been a godsend well a buddha send should i say yeah. <laughs> um because it's you know we some days you do wake up and you just go what's what's the point of getting up but actually you know I, I there is lots of points to getting up and and it's essential that people do get up and especially the the worse you're feeling the more it's important that you get up and get out um but then i i go straight to my gohonzon i've got a gohonzon and it's like a mandala and i chant nami and Gekyo, and it lifts my life state so if i chant enough i become um i can lift myself out of a hellish state into you know really great state of mind and then i that transcends so it's a ripple mm. effect so, you know, I mean, it's really, for me, I know when I'm around negative people, I know when I'm around positive people, I think we can feel it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we both know lots of negative and positive people. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm much more drawn to somebody who's positive. And it's just, you can't see it, it ju you just feel it, the energy. And, you know, 
so that's that's I prefer to be in that space but I also understand that some people have negativity because there's stuff going on in the life so I'll, I'll always give somebody the benefit of the doubt rather than just going I don't like them they're negative <laughs> I wouldn't do that they might be having <laughs> a bad day I mean how balanced you are you see because <laughs> there are other people that would do that oh I can't stand that negative energy and take themselves off but like I said you do, you do offer people the benefit of the doubt I mean when did your interest in Buddhism first begin you know you said 26 years ago but what kind of what sparked it or what you know were you are, are, are traveling or what was it well, um, I was in Watford. <laughs> <Say no more. laughs> I mean, sorry to the people in Watford. No, I mean, I was doing a show. I was doing the office party. I was on tour for the first time ever in my life, away from home. I had all these wonderful materialistic things. People would kind of go, you've got this amazing life. I had a boyfriend, I had the house, I had the nice car. I had a job as an actress. I was a jobbing actress. And so everything was there. I just didn't have that inner kind of happiness, you know, that everything could be um, my equilibrium, my kind of could be like um, flipped in a second, you know, mm. I could uh, get angry or uh, upset or, you know, my emotions were kind of like, Ooh. Mm. and it's probably maybe it's hormonal as well. But anyway, I was, I was on the, doing the show and one of the actresses on the show, as you know, we're always, we're always looking for a little skin tip or <laughs> beauty, beauty tip. <laughs> looking at her and going, she, Oh, her skin is just beautiful. She just glows. She's like, she's got this like radiance around her. And um, I said to her, Jilly, can I just ask you? I hope you don't think I'm rude, but what skincare do you use? And she was like, oh, it's not the skincare, darling. I'm a Buddhist. I chant Nami Aho I was like, oh, really? She went, yeah. She said, you can, she said, you don't need to buy that. I'll give you that one for free. <laughs> so I was like, oh, wow, that's amazing. So yeah. And, it, and it's so true. There's, I, I can spot somebody who's has you know who's a Buddhist or who has a positive mental attitude a, a mile away because they've just got this radiance it's like a shine um, and she was always happy and it's because she had a good life state she was always in a higher life state than the majority of other people <laughs> when <laughs> moaning actors <laughs> when do we get my holidays like when can I have a day off <laughs> yeah oh I've got the job have it oh when, when when yeah when is my first uh, day off. <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> but do you know what? That is so true because if I look at now when we very first met and something that I always think about you is that you're so radiant. So clearly, oh. like you said, you know, whatever you, what you learned from Jilly, you, you really took that and then you are now doing the same thing and passing that on to other people because it genuinely does shine through, you know, and, and as you mentioned there, kind of beauty secrets and things and I know obviously a lot of it does start from inside with you yeah. however you know are there any other go-to's for your well-being and you know for your beauty are there other things that you think actually I need to do that and then I actually feel really good I think <clears throat> definitely inside inward you know always go in first and make sure because there's nothing worse than going around with a frown on your face. I mean, you could you could spend a fortune on all this wonderful cream or whatever, but actually, if you're going around with a frown on your face and and fur, furrowed brow and like miserable, <laughs> it's not going to do anything, is it? I mean, you just you might as well just throw your creams away. So it definitely comes from the inside. But um, I've been told about silk pillowcases. Pillows, yeah, yeah. And, and I get it because actually when you wake up, sometimes you've got those crease marks on your face. I mean, that can't be doing your face much good. And um, so, yeah, silk pillowcase. So I've now got silk pillowcases. And um, what else? I think good diet, definitely a good diet. Mm -hmm. I try and eat as many vegetables as I can through, um, through water. I mean, I'm not great. I have got my water and I've got some water here, but... Oh, you're better than me. I've got tea. Look, <laughs> tea. Oh, you and your tea. You and your tea. <laughs> but, um, yeah, just definitely I don't drink fizzy drinks. I try, I try to eliminate as many things as possible. You know, don't smoke. Try not to drink too much. I mean, everything in moderation, I say, apart from the things that are really bad for you. I'm proven to be really bad for you. But, um... Yeah, definitely good skin. I've never gone to sleep with makeup on ever in my life. And um, yeah, and I think so definitely things like that. 
like when again when I see you you know you do always look so radiant as well and I, but and this is another thing that I know both of us have spoken about is you know as you get older though your hormones come into play and that is an absolute <laughs> nightmare isn't it you know like mm. I know like between us both when we've been on set together and working I'm like oh I'm so hormonal you know and my hair's really <laughs> greasy and it's just horrible <laughs> you know, is there anything that you that you take kind of for you know, that kind of thing, or, or even, you know, I, I know lots of people swear by evening primrose oils to tr- just, oh, yeah. because that's the stuff actually, as you said, starting from the inside that will Definitely. just genuinely help you because our hormones just play havoc with us, don't they? Yeah, I'm just looking now. I've got them somewhere. I'm like on collagen, so I'm taking like collagen sachets, yeah. really nice uh, collagen uh, with like fish oil and things in them. Um, evening primrose, black cohosh, obviously. For women who are now... And we start going into perimenopause a lot earlier than we think. And mm. I think that a lot of women don't realize that they're, they're actually going, you know, because they don't want to think of it. And it's such a taboo, the word menopause. People go, oh, oh, oh she's old, she's past it. Nothing to do with that. We start perimenopause in our 30s. You yeah. know, we're young. We're still able to give birth. And we're still able to conceive. And, you know, we still young women. We're still young women in our 40s, for goodness sake. But we have to go through all this on top of everything else. It drives me nuts. And um, I'm not somebody who actually talks about it very much. And I, and I really should because I feel very passionate about it now. But I think women have a really rough ride. And the, peri- and the men- perimenopause into the menopause is a horrible, horrible time for women. And it really needs to be not made to be. And more people need to come forward and talk about it because it's not, it's not a she's past it or she's right old now, you know. And it, just the, it is infuriating. I mean, I... T- I- I talk about it a lot on here. So all our listeners mm. will be like, oh yeah, I'm with you, I'm with you because they know Good. I talk about it so much. And I was asked Good. actually the question of, why are you talking about it? You're only in your thirties. And I said, because that's the point. The point is if we're not educated in our thirties, we don't know what to expect. We could also be being misdiagnosed with stress, which what happened to one of my friends, yeah. she was given antidepressants because yeah. they said, oh no, she's overstressed and overworked. And it turned out, it wasn't that at all. She was entering into perimenopause. Her hormones mm-hmm. had changed. And mm-hmm. for her to then be given antidepressants, which she didn't need to be on, I, I find really unfair, to be honest. I keep I keep campaigning and saying, we, we need a pamphlet when we're 35. We need a pamphlet that comes through the door. <laughs> yeah. I really think, you know, some of the lessons that we get taught at school are irrelevant. You never, ever use them. Teach young women teach young men and young women the the things that they need to know through life boys should be taught it too because they are going to be around mums or sisters or daughters you know or just friends to be able to understand what somebody's going through is as important as going through it yourself as well so i just think people need to be educated uh, and mental health just we're in a different world now and Mm. And people are fortunately being vo- more vocal about things and fortunately reaching out for help. But for all those people who do reach out, there's a, there's a hundred who aren't. So I think it's really difficult. And, and some of the symptoms that do come with perimenopause are, are horrible. And things that people wouldn't have so n- know, know, which is the insomnia that comes with it, you know. And then it's the vicious circle because you, you, you have sleep deprivation. You've not got the baby, you know, it's not through having a baby. baby. So you've got that lovely, lovely bit with the baby, you know, and it's all worthwhile. You just got, you just don't sleep. And then you've got to function throughout the day. People are going and doing jobs and they, they haven't had sleep. Your hair falls out. You end up with, you know, half your hair hair. You, you're constantly, you know, juggling your emotions and your energy levels. I mean, this is just on one thing, one part of being a woman, a you know, woman. of everything else. It's so hard. I mean, I, I, I really do applaud, you know, people like um, Alex Mahon at Channel 4 for actually putting in some of the, the work that she's done, you know, with, with taking women through the menopause in their careers. We've yeah. had a few ladies on um, in, in the past just talking about some of the things that have happened to them where they've ended up actually losing their jobs because they were going mm-hmm. through menopause. I actually read something on Twitter, actually, just literally yesterday with a yeah. lady saying, I can't believe it, I've been made redundant, so to speak, because I had time time off time off to see my doctor because I've been going through the menopause now I find that it's just 
unbelievable. So I do applaud women like Alex who are trying, you know, again, to spearhead the movement of making it better for women during this mm. transitional phase. Because then mm. you get to women in their 60s and 70s who are so smart and credible and brilliant and have got that life experience. And they need yeah. to be kept in those brilliant positions because they've got all that yeah. experience. You know, I'm yeah. very much a listen to your elders kind of person. And I mm. think women should just become irrelevant, you know, once they hit the menopause. I, I find that infuriating. <laughs> I know, absolutely infuriating. Uh, and also, you know, the other side of it, everyone who, I, who I've who i spoken to uh, who's gone through that and then they've come out the other side of it, they say that they have like this epiphany where they kind of go, I don't care anymore what people think. And um, if I want to do that, I want to do it. So they have this revelation and this total independence having gone through it, but having to go through it is the heart, really horrible bit. But then mm. the other side of it is apparently wonderful. So that's what we've got to look forward we've to. We've got to look forward to this. This is what I mean is I keep championing this and saying, right, come on, we, we can get through this middle bit together. Yeah. You know, and if it's we've got same... through the pandemic, we can get <laughs> we through can it. We can get through this. I mean, but going through the pandemic in the menopause, not good. Yeah, not crikey. Good. I mean, you know, if we, if we just switch it a little bit into, you know, styling, for example, because again, yeah. as you know, through the decades, your style evolves. What would you say is your kind of signature go-to style and, and you know, has it evolved? Yeah, I, I think, well, I started out wanting to be a goth, <laughs> but apparently I was too smiley to be a goth, so I got <laughs> goth, goth from, the, from the goth gang. Nah, you're too smiley to be a goth. Um, I love that. But then I went, oh, what should I be now? Oh, well, I know I'll be a weirdo. We used to call it weirdos because if you didn't wear conform to the norm, you'd be called a weirdo in my school. I don't know why. Um, but I quite liked being a weirdo at the time. But then I thought, mm, I don't really want to be a weirdo anymore. I think I'll just be bohemian. <laughs> so then I went bohemian. And then from bohemian, I went um, structured, kind of like, you know, suits and stuff. And then I so I had loads of different... And obviously I was 80s, so I had the 80s yes. and then the 90s. So I tried to follow a bit, but I've never been a follower of fashion as such. I like to dip in and out, but I'm very much um, get a piece and then I wear things around it. And also, I've never done stilettos because I can't walk in them. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a massive fan of RuPaul's Drag Race, but I could not walk in those stilettos. No, no, no way. In fact, it was hard enough playing Megan Mace because she always wore stilettos. They used to have to go out of the way to find me comfy stilettos. Now like, listen, I'm not even having that with you because my shoes in Emmerdale were the worst and you know they were like 18 inches. <laughs> I don't know how you walked in them. I really them don't. It's to see you walking down. I'd be like watching you walk down the... But you, you did it in style. I mean, you can walk in a stiletto. Oh. I would have been wobbling all over that corridor. Um yeah I, yeah, I did. I'm, I'm not one of those. But I think style-wise, it's all very uh, much like I always wanted to feel um, kind of not, uh, I don't know, um, what my, what, probably layered. I like floaty. I like, I'm a bit of everything. I'm a bit of a chow mein of fashion, but I seem to have some sort of fashion. Um, because everyone always says, oh, I, I love what you, you always wear really nice things, so I, I must do, but I don't know what it is. I've Just always like, felt colour. you were quite Carrie Bradshaw in that it was quite eclectic. You know, yeah. you, mix some, you mix a lot of different trends and it really works. And, no. you know, that's kind of what I've always got from you. And I've, I've always really admired that because, again, I think that's, it's an expression. It's the freedom of expression. And, you know, with the capsule, we talk a lot about not necessarily f following trends, but actually yeah. what feels good, what makes you feel amazing? Like, and that's what you should buy. And that's what you should invest in. And so you know, true. If it feels amazing and you go, oh, wow. Then yeah, that's what you, you definitely should, should uh, purchase. Do you have any things like that, that you step into and you go, oh my God, I feel amazing. Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm very much one for coats and bags, and um, yeah. So I love bags and coat. My I love Vivian Westwood. It's my favorite. My favorite designer is definitely Vivian Westwood, and I have a few. I'm luckily I've, I've saved up. Mind you, it's usually in the sales I go, um, and I've got a beautiful camel Vivian Westwood coat. And you know, every time I put that on, it's like a swoosh, and I always think. Yeah, I feel nice in this. No matter what, you know, we can have anything underneath. But when you've got your, <laughs> your coat on, a million dollars, I've got like a cheap tracksuit underneath or whatever. But it is, it, and also bags. I never buy, you know, obviously these things when you can get 
fake things. Yeah. I just don't bother because there's no point. I, I, I like to have the save up, save up. I'd rather save up over a long time and get the real thing rather than getting a, a knockoff or a, or a, a, a version of um, that looks like that, but isn't because it just doesn't make you feel, you know, then again, I, I look in the shops and they look at the real things and I think, geez, they look just like the knockoffs. <laughs> <laughs> but so. I think that investment shopping, though, like you said then, again, another message that we always give out is that invest because you'll have that piece Definitely. forever then and it will last you and you'll you'll have that for decades. And that's yeah. a better investment over time, you know, cost per wear, so, so much better than just getting oh, yeah. in and then it falling apart. Whose wardrobe out of every character that you've played have you loved the most? Oh, hmm. Oh, I would say I would say Lauren. Oh, <laughs> from Dark Friends. Friends. Yeah, she had quite an ele- eclectic taste. I mean, I love Megan Macy's. Don't get me wrong. Megan Macy's outfits were beautiful and really structured and very classy. But it not that's not my kind of style. I'm not that kind of you know chic girl. Um, so it was great to wear them, and they always look amazing and feel good. But that's not for me. But um, Lauren kind of wore really unusual put, stuff that was put together. She was probably more like me dress wise, what with what she wore in in the TV show. Um, so yeah, I think it's that. Yes, that I would go with Lauren. I love that that was your version of Lauren as well, because like obviously when I inherited her on stage in the musical, yes. I went for a very Kate Middleton look because obviously oh, she was slightly, yeah. you know, obviously it was slightly reworked for the show just to kind of get get us from beginning to end and a bit yeah. more obsessive with marriage. And I felt like she, her icon was Kate Middleton and that's who she envisaged. So that's, Absolutely. And, but it's so true how, you know, once you start to kind of take on those, those those ideas of your character and then they're born aren't they and you know again different interpretations I mean if we move to a a new character like you know let's talk about Cheryl in the syndicate I love Cheryl I mean the syndicate (laughs) it's the the fourth series the previous three uh you know it's it's the same kind of format in that we're following a group of people that have won the lot won the lottery together this this group in this fourth series is um a group of young vets and they've been scammed by Frank who is the post office owner and you play Cheryl his long-suffering fiance you know <laughs> tell me a bit more about her well I think that's the, the great thing about it at first sight you just think that she just you know she's just with this woman who loves this guy and she's just gonna um, stand you know she wants to get married she runs a shop and it's simple as that her husband runs off and, and her fiance runs off didn't actually quite get married they never yeah. got there <laughs> they ran off before they got married um and then so it's yeah, she's she's great. She's great fun to play because she goes on this real moral journey. You know, I mean, I don't know when when this is going out, but by by the this time will this will be goes, this Sunday, so this will be we're still on episode four now. Oh, okay. So you're basically seeing me um, packing. I yes. think you've seen me packing and getting my passport. So that that gives you a little telltale sign of what her thoughts are, what what she might be up to. Um, but you know, it's it's one of those things where she's tested all along the way, and I think she's gonna she's the real moral compass of the show. Mm. So she's the you know the kind of epicenter of the morals um, and and twos and fro's. And I think that's what happens when money gets involved in situations. You know, you do you do have this thoughts. You know, I mean, twenty seven million is a lot of money <laughs> yeah. to kind of go. Oh, just give it back. <laughs> um, but also you know some people wouldn't even hesitate and they just go it's not your money that's it but I think the fact that that Frank's already got it and is busy spending it (laughs) and um yeah and then obviously the syndicate weren't very particularly nice to Cheryl but then Mm. she wasn't particularly nice to them there's you know it's one of those things isn't it it's like greed stupidity money all these things all these you know emotions go with it I mean, and you, as you said, I mean, how you achieved this is beyond me altogether, all of you as a, as a company. You know, you actually got to go and film in Monaco as well, which that must have been fabulous. You know, you're thinking about fashion and amazing, beautiful things oh, to see. I mean, what was that yes. like? Monaco is a surreal place. I mean, the money there is ridiculous. 
I mean, we we were shocked when we saw a car that wasn't a Ferrari. We've gone, look, <laughs> <laughs> it's not a Ferrari. It's not a Ferrari, and that you know, it was ridiculous. But I loved it, and it was wonderful, and to to be to see those beautiful sunsets and to be at the ocean and everything. But I wouldn't want that lifestyle in Monaco. Mm. You know, I wouldn't want it. Even if even if it was offered to me, I wouldn't. Don't think I'd want it. It, it felt a little bit vacuous, you know, and not not real. It's like another world. But then it, it doesn't kind of fit with me as a person. I'm very much, ground, you know, I, I want to be grounded and I want to work for my money and I want to, I'm not somebody who would like to just be a lady that lunches or dines out every two minutes. I, I love the fact that it's a treat when you go out for a Yeah. Meal. So, but I mean, it was great as an actor to be filming there and especially because of the lockdown situation to actually have this um, escapism. Mm. But then we escaped to Monaco and then it got locked down. Oh. The minute we got there, France went into lockdown and there was a terrorist attack in Nice just oh. down the road from us. So it was you quite, um, quite frightened actually. Really frightening. It was really frightening because, you know, if there's a terror attack, and there's a film company happening and mm. we're in Monaco where there's lots of well, you kind of just going, oh. And obviously then the, the alert was high because it was mm. a terror. So we were constantly followed around by police. They'd be like, well, who are these people in these vans? Who are these people? You know, and because it was locked down, we, we, always, we kept getting stopped. What are you doing? Where are you going? Where's your permits? So we always had to have a work permit on us um, at all times. And if you didn't have anything, you would literally, it's an instant fine instant they want no messing around you don't mess around with the monaco police oh god no, no no they're notorious for again like you say they're very protective about who comes in and out as well yeah. um, i've seen them documentaries that i watch yeah. on television <laughs> it's just like that yeah. i watched it before we went and it's exactly the same i mean and it must have been guns. yeah it must have been quite scary because you you know you've got quite a young cast as well at the core you know they must have been quite quite scared I mean I've loved seeing this young cast come together they were brilliant and you know for me it was such a surprise seeing Joe Sugg I was just like he's yeah. absolutely brilliant and what I think is another signature of your mum is that she's written um you know an ensemble piece and I really love that style of writing and um, it's yeah. it's it's nice, isn't it, to kind of work within a company? Do you enjoy that rather than having lead this and lead that? You know, oh, the hierarchy yeah. is annoying. Yeah, I, I'm all about ensemble. I think it's. I think the pressure of being a lead oh, is, is immense, and also, it's just really nice to share the, the the load, you know, and to all be in the same boat and to all be carrying it together rather than one person carrying it and everybody else kind of, you know. It's um, like Fat Friends Musical. That was a real ensemble oh. piece. I mean, I know Jodie was um, kind of key, but you guys were all, oh. it felt very much like an ensemble piece. And she was very generous with that as well, wasn't she? Yeah. I mean, it was wonderful. Um, but yeah, I mean, the the syndicate as such is, is um, obviously it's always about the syndicate. But mm -hmm. this time it's got the two, you know, it's got Frank and Cheryl, and then it's got uh, Denise, bless Denise, Mercury yeah. Williams. Um, yeah, I think I think we all and Kay always writes about you know just one per, one person's episode, but surrounded and supported mm. by the rest of the the syndicate and the other people in within it. But you always get to find out more about one of the characters, which is which she's always done all through all her career. She's always done that with her writing. I, I think as well, it really makes for um, a very unified cast. As you said, yeah. you know, it de like for us with Fat Friends, we we're all still on a WhatsApp group, and it's three years ago. Do you know what I mean? And our wow. WhatsApp group is still going. And yeah. you know, for, for Jodie and Neil and I, we were to, we speak to each other nearly every day, and that friendship came from that bonding experience. And I think that's so important, where especially especially if you are travelling away, you know, and you're far and you're on tour or whatever, to to feel connected is really really important, you know. And I I think it's such a fabulous way of working, and and. This whether that's in theatre or whether that's on film or whatever. I mean, before we have to finish up, um, ah. this year, I know it's gone so fast, this year has undoubtedly <gasps> been so tough and, you know, we've come out of the pandemic. But the person that you are now, you know, what would you say, would you have any words of wisdom to your younger self? Um, I'd probably say, um, yeah, don't, don't care so much about what other people think. 
I think that's a really, really, oh, I'll tell you what, I heard something. This is, a, and this is, this is words of the wise, to the wise. Um, what other people think of you is none of your business. I love that. Mm. And I, and I'm going to live by that because it really isn't, you know, if, 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 somebody wants to talk about me behind my back or if somebody wants to say, you know, let them get on with it. It's really nothing to do with me. It's up to them. So yeah, I think don't listen to what other people, don't care so much about what other people think. I love that. That is such a brilliant, brilliant quote. And it's been so lovely to chat to you today <gasps> and to get all your words of wisdom. Bless you. It's so lovely to see you. And you look amazing. I mean, oh. lockdown's been good to you, my <laughs> <laughs> oh, honestly, you wouldn't you wouldn't think it really when I've been screaming my head off and like crying because I can't homeschool. <laughs> it's been horrible. I'm, I've been lucky that I've not had to do that. Thankfully, I haven't had to do that. But yeah, I, I've I've thought about all the parents who've had to do that, and that must have been really tough. It was, but do you know what? We're as you said, we're through it now, and hopefully, better days are coming. It has been an absolute joy to have you with me today. You too, darling. Thank you so much. And I hope you guys at home have all enjoyed listening to me and gain a chit chat on and that you can take away some brilliant advice from her there. If you haven't caught The Syndicate yet, you can catch it on Tuesdays on BBC One at 9pm or watch the whole series at BBC iPlayer. If you'd like more fashion, well-being and beauty, then as always, you can visit us at our website, www.thecapsule.co.uk, where you can also catch up with our previous podcast episodes by visiting the In Conversation page and subscribing to any of our podcast channels and YouTube. Do leave us your rates and reviews. As always, I love hearing your feedback. It's always so nice to read your amazing comments. If you're a social butterfly, you can also catch us on Instagram and Facebook at Official Capsule. I will be back next week with another very special guest. So all that's left for us to say today is goodbye. So it's goodbye from Gaynor. Bye. And goodbye from me. <laughs>